Hello, everyone. Good morning and good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Rodrigo Villa, Community Manager on the Cisco Learning Network, and I'll be your host for this webinar. In today's session, we will be covering what's new in ICE 3.0 Part 2, uh, and the topic was chosen by you. We'll be covering multi-factor authentication with our presenter, Suresh Nivanduri. But before we get started, I wanted to share just a couple of quick housekeeping notes. First, I do want to let our attendees know that our presenters are currently working from home, so if we do run into any technical issues during the webinar, we'll do our very best to resolve it as soon as possible. So we just want to thank you in advance for your patience and understanding. Next, if you have any questions during the session, we ask that you please post them in the question and answer panel, as that would help our panelists keep track of all of your questions and would also allow them to provide you with a much more timely response. Also, if you experience any audio issues during the live presentation, I do recommend using the call-in telephone number that I'm going to be posting in the chat window here in just a moment. Also, at the end of this webinar, you will get a pop-up survey with a couple of questions about today's presentation, and we would really appreciate it if you can just take a moment to fill it out and share with us any thoughts or feedback that you may have. Um, I also want to let our attendees know that this session will be recorded and will be available for on-demand viewing within approximately five business days after today, and I'll be sure to post some more information on that in the chat window a little bit later on. And last but not least, we will be launching a couple of poll questions throughout this presentation, and when we are ready to launch one of these polls, we will announce it live, and when you see it pop up on your webinar event screen, you'll have an opportunity to submit your answers. So we hope that you all can participate. And with all that said, I'm now going to turn it over to our speaker, and he'll kick off the webinar for today. So, Suresh, if you're ready, uh, over to you. Hey, um, thanks, Ligo. Hope you can hear me. Yes. So, yeah, as Ligo already mentioned, this is the topic we actually um, prepared based on the feedback we got from the earlier webinar. Um, so, this is the most requested. So, we would like to do that uh, for you. So, as uh, you already know, so I will be the presenter for this uh, webinar. So what we are going to cover in this um, session is like uh, we are going to touch on the zero trust model, um, and then we talk about the actual multi-factor authentication, what it is, what are the use cases, why uh, we need the multi-factor authentication kind of stuff. And then uh, we are going to um, go through the use cases uh, using the Cisco DO, which is our multi-factor authentication solution. And we will explore the components involved in the overall solution, and then uh, we'll um, deliver some of the demos as well uh, from the uh, use cases we are going to show. So before we start, uh, we would like to know, do you already use MFA? So we have the options here to select, like, you're already using, like, yes, no, or you would like to use that MFA, or you might not aware of the, or the MFA itself. So the question will be posted in your polling window. So please uh, do answer value your response. Okay, zero trust. Um, before we uh, explain what actually zero trust is, let's um, look into what actually um, the uh, the uh, overall evolution of network security throughout these uh, generations we can say, right? So we are showing some three different icons on this slide, like the walls, insiders, and clouds. So let me explain something on that, right? So the classic, um, the castle and moat approach, which you're seeing on the uh, left um, hand side, right, is the best fit, like the example uh, where the trust is based on location and network. So in this model, uh, you, you focus on defending the network perimeter and assuming that everyone and everything already inside the network, inside the walls is trusted and good, right? And this model was created when employees used corporate computers on corporate network within the company boundaries, uh, like maybe a boundary or walls, right? So in simple terms, it all works based on inside and outside, um, uh, or it's an outside concept, right? So, um, which is where inside is trusted and outside is not trusted on very simple terms. But in today's uh, corporate um, environment, right, we cannot define lines between inside and outside networks. Uh, and this is uh, blurred as employees can work from anywhere, often using their own devices. At the same time, um, the vendors or other third party 
other third party uh, parties may require more access to your corporate network as well. So when, um, even though the perimeter security is effective in keeping enemies out, uh, it doesn't do much for users within compromised identities or uh, other insider threats that already uh, got into your castle or into the walls. And again, now with this cloud, which is uh, one of the largest uh, the drivers for the technology change in the companies uh, today. So enterprises are enterprise uh, are uh, looking or increasing uh, their movement towards um, the uh, the cloud, like they are moving the data or the applications uh, to the cloud. So with that, there are no more boundaries for any network. Uh, companies uh, got corporate network, uh, the data centers. Uh, on prem or even on on cloud, and they moved applications uh, to the cloud. Uh, even the users started working uh, remotely, not just within the corporate networks or the boundaries. So, uh, so it's it's uh, one cannot define just uh, the trust based on the location and network uh, in this uh, in this current situation. Right? So, with simple inside and outside definitions, it's very difficult to defend uh, the network. So we need to secure our workplace and the workforce uh, no matter where they are located. So uh, is it possible if you ask then yes, it is all possible based on the zero trust. So let's see how it is, I mean what actually it is, how we can achieve uh, this highly effective and uh, very simple uh, solution deploy. So, uh, so in this new uh, shift in the overall IT landscape and the business challenges that evolved as a result, right? New threats are also uh, emerged, and these threats now are targeting like the identities, like the users and the user devices. So if you see some of the numbers here, like 81 percentage of breaches involved uh, compromised credentials, uh, showing that the passwords are an effective way to get. Uh, students, I mean, traditional uh, perimeter defenses, what we spoke earlier, and get access to the applications uh, through uh, undetected methods. And even these uh, threats are targeting your applications, right? So uh, around 54 percentage of uh, web app vulnerabilities have a public exploit available to the malicious uh, intenders like hackers, right? Meaning if servers and applications are patched, they are left open to known flaws, so that can be exploited by an attacker to get access to your systems. So, and even um, these threats can target your devices, right? According to one of the um, security labs, right, we found that 300% uh, is, is the rise in the new overall uh, the malware variants from um, in a year, right? So proving that uh, the connected devices are being targeted more than ever by attackers. So, so these are some of the um, uh, current uh, the trends, right, of the overall threat landscape, and how are the uh, the exploitation is happening um, based on the vulnerabilities. So how how we are going to um, achieve that? Uh, zero trust model and how it how the zero trust model is itself different from our traditional approach right so when you compare this uh, traditional security approach to zero trust uh, approach so you will find that the old approach the classic uh, approach like the uh, the the wall right a wall mode kind of strategy uh, trust is based on uh, solely on the network location so uh, like the way the actually access is uh, originated from but in a zero trust approach, trust is more uh, dynamic and adaptive. So it established for every access request, no matter where the request comes and where the user located. So this approach uh, from the zero trust prevents attacks, uh, attackers from uh, moving uh, laterally within your network to get your data. Uh, so it, it secures access across your apps, your networks, and um, only allows the right users and devices to get access. In addition to that, uh, to a better access security, right? The zero trust approach also supports uh, modern enterprise models like uh, with the BOAD, uh, securing the cloud application or maybe the hybrid applications as well. 
so uh, this is something like the three tenants of the uh, trust, uh, zero trust uh, network we can say that we're showing on the slide so the first one we can start with the eliminate trust so this is what we already uh, mentioned uh, in one of the slide right so uh, we are not going to trust anyone right so we need to assume that all traffic uh, regardless of the location right uh, is like a threat right so uh, so we need to verify each and everything let them authorized inspected and then only they will be provided uh, the requested access this is something uh, we are starting with not trusting anyone even they are located inside the network they will be secure zone or a secure network right? the second part is the segment uh, network access so in this uh, part right we need to start with a very least privilege right uh, we are very strict kind of access so we need to control the overall resources that user uh, trying to access is uh, as per the requirement as per what they are supposed to have and make sure the the overall uh, the segmentation is happening clearly between the uh, different uh, different users or different type of networks right and they are supposed to access what they are supposed to but not anything extra or low right and then the gain network visibility and analytics, right? So it's not just done with doing the segmentation and mating trust, right? We need to continue um, continuously inspect or monitor and do logging of the overall traffic, right? Especially uh, for the um, for the real time uh, protection for from the threats. So so when you can see more information, so when you can see uh, more about your network, it's easy to um, uh, create policies or get the overall protection. So what uh, role ICE plays in the overall zero trust, right? So when it comes to zero trust, ICE um, is for the workplace, right? So ICE, I mean, Cisco ICE makes it very easy to gain the visibility and the control over who what's on your enterprise network and what they're continuously across uh, wireless wide and VPN connections so um so it's it's a kind of um ice i mean i mean if we go back what actually i suppose it will do is it provides some kind of network access uh secure network access and it, it is actually the core of the zero trust approach if you look back the slides what we explained that's the core approach so we need to provide a secure network access. This is for the workplace. So it delivers a complete visibility by identifying, classifying, and assembling the necessary context of the users and the device, like endpoints. Uh, it authenticates and authorizes them based on what actually your intent is, right? Like the business intent or IT intent. So your, your security policies and grants an appropriate level of network access just based on um, the uh, limited needs so if needs of based on their roles or maybe the functions so an appropriate level network access is very critical in zero trust right? so ice provides network segmentation to align with the least privileged security concept ice also makes it simple and easy to allow authorized network communications among your endpoints while blocking everything else so ice uses granular segmentation in the network uh, access edge eliminating the need for additional security appliances uh, and the complicated infrastructure configurations or maybe expensive internal firewalls. So by bringing the user and devices, I mean device information with these additional security products and services, ICE helps them assess, uh, correlate and enforce the vulnerability and the uh, threat for automatic uh, Control as well when we do the integration with the uh, uh, with the uh, our ecosystem partners to the contextual information sharing. So when it comes to do um, which is uh, providing the zero trust for your workforce, right? So geo security uh, actually complements ICE and provides the visibility by establishing user and device trust at the, say, at the time of access. So 
So it provides the ability to authenticate the user connection to the resource and uh, verify the access when they are trying to attempt. So with that said, uh, Duo delivers on Duo Trust for your workforce by verifying the identity of users and by ensuring the security hygiene of the endpoint devices before the uh, before it allowing the users to connect to the application they are need to do their job and and in this uh, will make sure the IT administrators are benefited uh, from having to leverage one single admin panel where they can manage users set access policies and ultimately get the granular visibility into which user is uh, using what device to uh, gain access or which application they are trying to access. So Duo Security and Cisco ICE, um, they provide, I mean, this provides a solution to secure the modern enterprise with the deep visibility into users, devices, and applications, not just on on-prem uh, or on the off network as well. So these solutions um, provide a very comprehensive application and network access control uh, that are very simple and effective as well. So the goal is to enable the workforce with appropriate access from anywhere, but um, how can the trust be established in these users or devices that are connecting? This is again um, using these solutions uh, when they get integrated properly. So securing the workplace networks from unauthorized access, vulnerable devices, and preventing cyber attacks from effective mission critical assets are crucially uh, are crucial for the network and the security teams. So when it comes to the zero trust approach uh, to secure to provide the security, uh, these tools are needed and they are addressing the challenges. So by combining the power of uh, these two best uh, in class security products, security is not only improved but the burden on the internal teams is also eased. Um, so this is the overall um, intention of. Uh, combining these two solutions to uh, give you a complete uh, access for different different use cases and different uh, type of networks you're going to use not just as I mentioned on-prem but for the cloud or off-prem uh, of the network as well like remote users. So with that said let's move on to the multi-factor authentication topic. So um, Multi-factor authentication uh, from Cisco Duo, we can say it protects your application by using a second source of validation like a phone or token to verify your identity before granting access. So Duo is engineered to provide a simple streamlined login experience for every user and application. And as a cloud-based solution, it integrates easily with your existing technology. So it designed for the modern workforce and backed by the, the zero trust philosophy we uh, already uh, gone through that Cisco provides. So Duo is Cisco uh, user friendly and a scalable access security platform that keeps our business ahead of ever changing the security threats. So this is the best in the class and much easier to deploy and even to adapt uh, when you're looking for a multi-factor authentication. So in the simple words, um, Multi-factor authentication, in short, MFA is a method of confirming users uh, claim the identity by using a combination of different factors. As you see on the slide, this is something they know, like the username password, right? And something they have. So this is one of the MFA methods, uh, maybe using a device or a other methods which we are going to talk about. Uh, this is something you have which you need to respond dynamically these are not static or automated way. These are something you need to interact and you need to respond. And the third one is something they are, right? You need to prove something uh, like your identity with the modern uh, mobile devices we have, or the, not just mobile device, any other devices we have the, uh, uh, process, I mean, we have the option to prove ourselves like the identity, like the, your fingerprints or maybe your iris or your face, right? something like that. So this is, 
how you are how you are going to uh, explain in MFA uh, in a simple terms. So the overall goal of MFA is not to allow an attacker uh, impersonating as the owner, right? Uh, when the attacker holds the position of a device. So this is the overall agenda, right? Um, even though they got the uh, credentials, they still need to uh, make sure they are going to respond to this, uh, the uh, the other factor of authentication. So uh, the most common example of an MFA is the process uh, for a for accessing an ATM at a bank, right? So so to gain access uh, to any of the data accounts, right? User must insert a physical factor like bank card and just enter the pin, which is a uh, kind of known thing for only to user until unless you share with others. So um, why use an MFA? Um, you would like to uh, showcase some five different uh, uh, factors here, right? Um, in order to define why MFA solution is required. So if you start with the first one, which is credential theft uh, protection. So this is very uh, the common use case or uh, the the factor should be considered when you are trying to when you are looking for an MFA. So even though your credentials got uh, compromised, right, there should be a second factor or the other factor where uh, those cannot be compromised or a dynamic in way. So in this way, you are going to provide a protection for a uh, uh, compromised uh, credentials. The second one is the regulatory compliance. Um, most of the enterprises today, uh, they need to make sure they are compliant to these industrial uh, regulatory compliance standards. So um, in, in, in current standards, MFA is the most recommended for, from the most of these uh, regulatory compliance uh, bodies out there. So if you are uh, make, if you are going to get for any compliance, right, uh, in, in the networking uh, infrastructure, so you must be having this uh, MFA for that. And the other one is the gain visibility. We are, we mentioned already in, in a couple of uh, times in the earlier slide, right. So with the MFA, you are going to, like using Duo solution, you are going to get a much um, greater visibility of the users, the devices, uh, uh, their location, right? All those kind of information is much required to uh, enforce the network access or maybe to uh, provide the access uh, on a very um, granular level. And the, th and the, the next one is uh, enforce security policy. So this is not just on the network access level, but on the location-based, group-based, or, or, um, or the health of a uh, uh, health of the endpoint, right? So there are multiple factors we can configure on the Duo, which is an MFA solution, uh, to enforce the security poli uh, policies. So this will make sure the endpoint and the user are compliant to these policies, right? In, in order to get access, so in order to get a successful authentication from the two-factor, I mean, the multi-factor authentication. The last one is the consistent access security. So this will make sure that, uh, you, it will make sure that overall uh, you are going to um, create an infrastructure where the uh, the access limits are consistent uh, for in, in an entire, uh, maybe a region or your enterprise level. So this will make sure the uh, IT has a, a smooth sale, right, or a um, good uh, the visibility on the overall the security landscape, so that they can simply uh, simplify the overall management of the uh, the uh, security uh, access for the users or the devices. So, so this is something on the. Um, how the geo secure uh, login process happens. So um, if you see, let me grab the pointer. Okay. So uh, step one, um, the user uh, uses primary device to log in um, and provides his uh, primary, I mean, provides his uh, primary uh, authentication, I mean, account details uh, to maybe access an application or a server, right? So the server is somehow configured to um, use the mechanism of uh, the uh, the duo, which is our MFA, 
and that will be sent MFA. The duo will verify the request, and based on the configuration, it it will it can do the primary authentication and uh, send send to the uh, uh, to the second authentication, right? So second authentication, which happens on the device, um, based on the configuration, it can be a, any one of the options available. So once a successful response is uh, done by the user on the secondary device uh, for the second authentication, uh, there will be a success for the overall process. This is how, uh, on a very high level, how the process, uh, very simple, right, straightforward, how the overall uh, process happens using Duo for MFA. So we have links uh, to multiple demos on how the uh, the process happens for different different use cases. You can always go to our Duo site to look into those demos. I keep on saying there are multiple options to use MFA, right? These are the options available with the Duo, right? When you are considering second authentication, I like the, um, we have uh, Duo Push, uh, which is a very uh, commonly used, a widely used second authentication method. And we have um, options like physical, uh, uh, physical authenticated by tapping a universal uh, two-factor authentication like USB device or using a built-in biometric authenticator such as Touch ID, that's also uh, supported. So do you also accommodate more traditional second factor authentication controls uh, as well like users can confirm the identity using a uh, secure passcode generated by a physical token or a mobile device or a network administrator. So these are multiple ways, not just it's restricted to a single uh, way of doing that. It all depends on how, which is, which is more uh, suit you, which is more convenient to the user based on uh, the use case or based on the way they work. So uh, before we go into the next poll, Vigo, uh, can you just uh, let us know what's the result for the previous poll? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Suresh. Uh, okay, so now it's time to share the results from our first poll. And just to remind our audience, the question was uh, if you use MFA. And our top answer and overwhelming majority uh, of, of you actually said yes to using MFA. And then for our next uh, second top answer, I can see that our participants answered no to using MFA. That's good to know. Um, maybe they can consider this session to more know about the MFA. And maybe they can start adopting it. Okay, so the next poll, will you open up that poll for our audience? Yeah, absolutely. And then for, the, for this poll, we're just curious to know which MFA option uh, more suits your requirement. Uh, so for this one, you have a handful of answer options. You have push, soft token, SMS, phone call, hard token, U2F, or biometrics. So I'll launch the official poll right now, and, and please do take a moment to submit your answers. Uh, and also, uh, sorry, just a, just a friendly uh, reminder, uh, just to uh, make sure we stay on track. We have about 30 minutes left of the of the presentation. Yeah, got it, Rigo. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's see uh, what are the components involved in Duo. So, the first thing is um, the, uh, the Duo admin panel itself. So, this is where um, uh, the admin is going to configure uh, the policies, the applications that we are going to secure for uh, the multi factor authentication, the overall users that are supposed to be uh, uh, there in the custard by the Duo to uh, get authenticated, right? And the groups of the users, the devices that we are going to enroll to for the as a secondary device. So all these, any other admin admin kind of configurations, all will be done uh, from the um, Duo admin panel itself. So we will go, we will uh, have a look into this while we are going to the demo. What are the options uh, while we are going through one of the use cases? The second part of uh, we can say second component, uh, the overall uh, Duo solution is the uh, user enrollment, right? So users and their phones or tabs or hard tokens must be enrolled into the Duo before they start using the system, the overall solution. So um, for that, Duo provides several enrollment, met en uh, enrollment methods uh, to uh, add the users and the device to the system. If it, when it comes to user enrollment, so we have self-enrollment that allows users to add themselves to Duo and walk them through uh, setting up devices for two-factor authentication. So for a larger organization, um, may, uh, they may prefer one of the authentication involvement of options like uh, synchronizing users from their existing uh, in, uh, user identity stores like Microsoft Active Directory. 
So, and even administrator can create an individual to account users at any time, which is nothing but a manual element. So, an admin has the capability to create users, which is uh, one of the part of one of the method of uh, enrolling the user. The next one is uh, Duo Authentication Proxy. Uh, it's a on-prem software service um, that receives authentication requests from your local devices and applications via ADS or a lab. Uh, optionally performs the primary authentication against your existing uh, LDAP directory or maybe ADS authentication server like ICE and then contacts Geo uh, to perform the secondary authentication. It's a very lightweight service running, uh, can be run on a Windows or a Linux server and uh, it, can only, it can only do the second factor authentication although we can configure that uh, in that way uh, leaving the primary to the, uh, the overall uh, the server and it can simply proxy for the second authentication only. So it has some uh, uh, inbuilt troubleshooting tools and locks as well. If you are going to, uh, if you are having some issue and want to know what happened on the authentication proxy level, so that's also there with that. And the next one is the Geo Access Gateway. Uh, it's also an on-prem software service that receives uh, actual authentication requests from your local protected application via SAML. So the protected cloud application or the local applications will be redirected, um, will redirect your users to the new access gateway, in short DAG, uh, on your network. So DAG acts as a SAML identity provider uh, and the authentication users using your existing primary authentication source for credential verification and then prompting for a two-factor authentication before permitting access to the SAML application. So, um, if you are not aware of what SAML, it's a uh, security assertion um, markup language. It's a XML-based standard uh, for uh, authenticating the identity uh, for a, for a uh, overall authentication process. So, um, you might be seeing, you might be heard some other terms as like service provider or the identity provider, right? So, we will look into these terms when, when we are into one of the use cases. So, uh, similar to uh, the uh, Duo Access uh, Authentication Proxy, um, Duo uh, Access Gateway can also be installed on Windows and uh, our Linux service, uh, the servers. This is something we want to mention and even this was uh, included in the previous webinar that, uh, um, so now with uh, i3.0, uh, Azure AD with MFA is possible when you are using SAML as your uh, authentication mechanism, right? Where uh, maybe if you want to use the guest portals or the BYD portals or other portals where you want to access securely and you want to use MFA uh, with a cloud AD, then now it is possible with 3.4, which is not there with 2.x, where we have some kind of limitation where uh, the uh, the IC itself is looking for some kind of authentication mechanism should be uh, supported by the issue. So that was uh, uh, not there. So now we are okay to use that with Redadvo. So let's uh, go into MFA use cases. So we would like to cover for cover more fine uh, for um, main use cases like device administration, network access control, ICE portals, and remote users, where we are going to use the MFA um, to say it for securing the overall uh, access in these various uh, methods. So. Uh, before that, I hope we got the results uh, from the previous poll. Yes, thank you, Suresh. Um, yep. So I'll just take a brief moment to share the results from our previous question. And as a reminder, the question was, which MFA option uh, more suits your requirements? Um, and we definitely have a good mix of responses, but I do see that push took the number one spot here. Uh, and then for the next up answer, we have SOP token as the MFA option that suits the requirements from our audience. Yeah, that's no surprise. That's one of the easiest and widely deployed. Yeah. Okay, I think we have another poll. Um, would you like to announce that to our attendees? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so for this for for this question, so we'd like to know for which use case would you like to adopt MFA? So uh, you have five answer options there in front of you, device admin, network access control, 
remote user VPN, ICE portals, or none. So I'm going to go ahead and launch the official poll right now. You should see it pop up on your screen in just a moment, and then uh, you'll have an opportunity to submit your answers. So uh, thank you, and back to you, Suresh. Thank you. Again, uh, we really appreciate your feedback and uh, response. Okay, uh, let's start with uh, the uh, first use case that we are going to show. I mean, talking about which is device administration, right? So this is uh, the, normally uh, the device administration is to perform different kind of tasks, right? To get access to the network devices and uh, can be configuration or maybe a monitoring purpose. So in general, um, there, there will be different roles assigned to the network uh, teams, right? Like admins or operators. And uh, and there should be a different uh, level of access as well. Uh, that's in a, in a general use case. So when these users trying to access the network gear like router switches or firewall, so we we need to make sure them uh, make sure those uh, requests or logging requests are securely uh, logged in, right? Not just with username and password, but adding an MFA solution like Duo, right? This will make sure uh, we are not allowing some um, some of the users who somehow uh, got the credentials uh, somehow right, and they got these credentials maybe through the theft or other compromisation techniques, right? And they logged in. So, but with MFA, we are making sure that they need to have the secondary or third, I mean, other multi-factor authentication where they need to respond to that challenge, right? Through that MFA uh, through Duo. So. How we are going to do that? Um, so uh, this is how. Um, I mean, there are two boards we can uh, we will say are methods that we can uh, do with the device administration. Uh, uh, we we can call it as uh, radius auto append and radius challenge. So when we use radio radius auto append, so um, the user who are trying to log into the devices. Uh, for the network gear and network devices, they need to make sure they are entering the username and password uh, and the the method uh, they want to use, right? So using a separator, like if you see the example, first example on the top, uh, the user has to provide the username and the password like Cisco123, the separator and the method like push. So this is, they need to append that particular method they want to use. So if, by doing that, it will be making sure that they provide the, uh, primary uh, account details and they would like to use the push as a secondary method which are integrated to the duo. Similarly, we have SMS, phone and code, but somehow if you want to leave it blank without any separator, this the default is push uh, as per the uh, configuration on the duo uh, panel. So the other method is the radius uh, challenge. Um, this is where um, if you are going with this method, you won't be uh, having the facility to uh, add the separator and provide the uh, whatever the challenge method right here the default is you are going to provide the options available based on the configuration are provided by you provided to by the admin so if, if you see on the screen tag one of the examples says that you provide the username password then you will be provided the available uh, the options right for MFA the second factor authentication we can say here then either you can select which of the one are you can simply uh, provide the passcode is one of the uh, option there. Then you are allowed to use that. So, so for that, um, the, the other side, the, the the user must be having uh, the application running on the secondary device where they get uh, these uh, either the push or maybe the passcode that they are going to enter here. So this is how the overall flow uh, looks like uh, for a device administration when we are going for MFA. So the user starts uh, logging to a device providing the username password, right? So since the network devices are configured in such a way that they are looked towards the AAA server like ICE to verify the credentials of the endpoint, uh, I mean the user, the admin. So, and uh, this, this ICE will be configured to forward the request to the duo authentication proxy. Uh, which acts uh, as a proxy that can verify the primary authentication using your local credential identity store like AD. And once that is successful, it will be sent to the Duo Cloud for the second authentication. So once that is done, uh, based on the, the the integration happened between the Duo Cloud and the secondary device of the user, there will be a push note, I mean, there will be a request sent to the uh, 
uh, to the um, the second device it can be a push here in the example we use push right so that will be popped up on the secondary device so they need to respond back and once they responded back based on the credentials or the uh, the proper response uh, if it is a success then it will be sent back uh, from the duo uh, cloud to the duo authentication proxy now the duo authentication proxy will respond with the radius uh, response radius response as access accept um, i mean access accept to the ice so this is where the overall authentication is happened. So the next thing is to the next phase so is the authorization, right? So based on the policies you create on the operation level, uh, the end user who is trying to access the network gear will get the access. It can be uh, maybe role based or a other uh, different conditions that we provide in the authorization policies. So let's see how this works um, on a demo. So I would uh, let me open my okay. I will be sharing my remote desktop that has access to my demo network. Hope you can see. So this is uh, my the demo ice console here, and uh, we have other components also involved here uh, like the Duo access gateway and the to admin panel and to uh, navigation proxy as well. So if I go and uh, check uh, the network devices here, since we are going to do the device administration, uh, we have already had the device. Uh, this is one of the uh, the device that we are going to perform the uh, device administration. That's already. Hi, Suresh. I believe we might have lost your audio there. Hello, Suresh. Uh, I'm sorry, folks. Uh, please do bear with us for just a moment while while we get our uh, presenter back on online here. Uh, thank you so much for your patience. And Can you just can you just confirm that I'm audible? Yes, perfect. We can hear you now. Thank you very much. Yeah, there are some network disconnections. Sorry for that. Yeah. So let me resume uh, what I'm saying. So uh, the first thing is we need to make sure we have uh, proper uh, integration happen between um, the uh, admin panel and the duo authentication proxy here. So for that uh, we are going to we already logged into admin panel and I click on applications here um, so I mean for making it quicker right for the day uh, for the demo since we have uh, constraints on the time so we already added a created application um, so where we can get the integration key the API key and the secret key so these keys will be used um, to do the overall Integration uh, between the duo admin panel and the authentication proxy. So this is uh, sorry. Okay, this is my uh, duo authentication proxy. So 
let me show the configuration done on it uh, to have the integration between the communication between admin uh, the cloud and the proxy so if i bring it down a little bit so oops, sorry so basically what we're doing is we are uh, providing the identity key the secret key and the api host information of the uh, the duo cloud here so we just need to make sure we are matching those credentials here right so yeah so we can see this so these are the identity key and the api host so by adding this to the all uh, the the configuration file in the dap uh, we are securely uh, making a change in these two to have the communication similarly uh, we are adding the radius uh, IP as well, which is ICE here, right? Uh, VN 10254, right? And you see radius secret key also here. Uh, and this is IP where the IP that is used by the DAP. So this is the file. Um, let, me, I mean, let me scroll down. Okay. So this is the uh, radius uh, file uh, that we configured on the DAP. So if you see this section, we are going to use the challenging method, not the auto method, which is auto append. So we are going to use the challenge where the uh, user who is trying to access uh, need to uh, select one of the method or enter the passcode. So if I go back to ICE, and uh, the administration, the external identity stores, so this is where we are using the same the uh, same uh, the secret key to um, uh, integrate DAP as a radius uh, token server here. So we already done this integration here. You are providing this information, but we can see the configuration what we done. So to click on um, a new connection, we are going to provide the name and under the connection tab. So we are going to provide the IP. This IP, if you remember, is the DAP IP, and this is the shared secret key. One of the key thing is uh, we are keeping server timeout as 60 seconds. This will make sure the overall uh, the two factor, the overall two factor authentication process has some good amount of time to um, challenge um, happen a challenge from the duo and the user can respond back within that 60 minutes of 60 seconds of window. So this is. Um, something uh, uh, the settings on the uh, the external identity store so now uh, let's see the policies um, go to workstation work centers then the division under that we are going to see the division in policy sets so we are using the default policy set under the default policy set So if I uh, go down to the authorization policies, so we are going to uh, use, uh, two different policies to differentiate the overall uh, level of uh, access, like employees and contractors. All we are doing is this is based on the uh, the uh, AD users. Uh, we already had an AD to the eyes, so we we'll verify this. Uh, groups based on the AD integration. If it is an employee, you will get all the access to the complete uh, access to the, all the commands with higher level of privilege, like 15, uh, in terms of iOS devices. And for contractors, uh, there are some limited of uh, commands uh, with a uh, full privilege, uh, full uh, level of shell access. But their commands are limited here. And others, whoever else belong to the other groups are not uh, matched here, they will be denied all commands. So this is, these are the policies. Uh, let's see how actually this works um, in the real time. So if I, if you remember, I already had a device configured or added as a network device where the users are trying to access. So let me open the message search to that uh, network device. So this is uh, the one, if you remember the CSR. So I'm trying to use the contractor 
credentials right um, and let's see okay so since we are using the radius salad method uh, here we are asked to enter the uh, the passcode right so for that uh, i need to go to my device where i have the passcode I mean, where I have the duo uh, secondary, where I'm using the device as a secondary uh, user device. So I'm expecting a passcode here. I mean, yeah, this is the passcode I can use. So I'm just refreshing it. Since I'm not using push, I will simply use the passcode that is available here. So very little lag I'm accessing the lab, but 785452. So that's the passcode I was supposed to enter. Okay. Okay. Two. All right, let me verify time. Too many windows. Let me minimize this. I entered the passcode. Okay, the connection was expired. Restart the session. Contact that one. The password. And I will bring this little bit down. And this one up. Okay. So, uh, maybe we just pass for more time. Okay, four seven nine five five four. Okay, so we are good. So let's check the commands. Uh, I'm trying to enter the the configure terminal more. We are good. So since it's a contractor, we are expecting you should not have uh, more privileges, I mean, more access level to the commands. So I'm trying the host name. I want to try, change the host name of the device itself. So based on the configuration, uh, you got denied because you don't have the access authorization to use those commands. So let's see if I um, do the same thing. For an employee who has before that, uh, okay, let me use it. Employee one, so that's the username and the password. We are good. I will refresh this because we are not supposed to do the same. That's a one time. Uh, four seven two three two nine. Okay, so we got we are into the device. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm expecting the employee should have a full level of access, including the host name change. So there you go. So this is, I mean, we all know how the Role based access works with the uh, eyes in terms of device administration, but the way they want the thing we want to show is how the second factor authentication adds an extra layer of security because they need to go and look into the second device and response from there. So, if I um, go to the Cisco eyes, 
to check uh, the logs operation live logs for attack x so i will set loss uh, i think it might be yeah so i can see uh, contractor one and employee are logged in and there is one uh, failure right because this is very contractor try to use the command which is not supposed to use so even we can see which command is written why he failed right this is the host name he tried and it says the command failed due to the authorization uh, policies that are there so that's what i was supposed to, i was trying to show uh, how the uh, can be done for a different administration to add this extra layer of security let me switch back to my slide um, I see something on Q and A. But maybe we can try that later. Yeah. yeah. And uh, sir, uh, just a quick reminder: uh, we are near the top of the hour, so we got a couple of minutes left. Yeah, most probably in under five ten minutes we'll finish now. Yeah. Sure. I hope. I mean, uh, the indies will be stick with us because it's something we are going to show uh, the demo as well. So the second use case is network access control. Um, here, um, it is possible where if you want to use uh, MFA for an uh, 8 or 1 x uh, access uh, network access control. So there are some of the considerations uh, we need to make sure we notice that are like uh, for divide I mean 8 or 1 x combined with FFA, MFA, we need to use EPGTC protocol and uh, it is supported with uh, the NAM module only, Cisco NAM module. And these are the four uh, authentication secondary effect secondary authentication methods are available push synchronized phone and passcode and both the the modes like appending mode and various challenge mode can be used there is no limitation on that and the, what are the configuration components involved in this particular use case where you are going to use MFA for a secured way of factory access which is 8 or 1 x uh, one Thing I mentioned the NAM configuration, which is NAM profile, uh, to make sure it's set to use uh, as per the considerations, and the uh, proxy, which can act as a proxy for um, both for verifying the primary uh, credentials and uh, to do the secondary as well through the duo cloud. And the duo cloud admin panel, where we are going to go configure some of the policies, adding the whole uh, application, right, which we are going to protect on the duo admin panel. So this is what uh, the any connect name configuration. So the last slide, if you look into, so we are using EPFAS under that uh, the EFP GTC, which we mentioned, so that should be uh, used if you are looking for an MFA for a, a data to one x way of securing your network. And the flow, how it looks like, um, uh, whenever the endpoint connects to the uh, NAT, right, the network devices, the NAT will request um, or the identity, the endpoint will respond with anonymous uh, identity that will be sent to ICE as a uh, the ADS request, right? So ICE will ICE and end user, um, the end user client will uh, agree upon a protocol, which here it will be GTC. Once that is done, the really secure communication channel will be uh, built, right? Uh, and I mean, using that channel, uh, the client will start um, sending its credentials like username, password and then the secondary uh, uh, method as well. So um, here we are going to use our proxy as our um, on-prem uh, device audio, and Duo will verify the primary on the local, and it can go for the, uh, will go for the Duo Cloud for the secondary authentication, like any of the challenge options like push or code uh, based on the configuration. Once the secondary is done, it will send back to our proxy. Our proxy will send a, uh, Notification device like radius X. Uh, the ICE, ICE will verify the further authorization policies and provide the respective access. This is the, uh, the flow how it will be for the second use case. So, when it comes to third use case, um, here uh, we are going to uh, the users trying to access the ICE portals, like the ICE portal, and uh, the, the uh, uh, here we are going to Secure the the portal itself, which is nothing but an application, right? Uh, with MFA. Um, so um, normally, I mean, in a general case, there will be different kind of uh, users like guest, contractors, employee, uh, trying to use your guest portals to get into your network, right? Maybe for temporary access, or maybe employees doing the same portal to get into 
uh, your net for uh, corporate access as well. So here um, are going to use some um, because the portals are involved. We are going to uh, secure the application itself, and you can see the different uh, components involved in the overall process, like the service provider, the identity provider, the user, right? So basically, in this overall process, there will be a trust relationship between the service provider and the identity provider. The service provider, nothing but the application the user trying to access, and the identity provider is nothing but who has the identity information about the user. So these two components will have a trust relationship. So whenever user try to access the service provider for some kind of access, like the application access, right? The service provider will uh, uh, send a, a notification to user to go to the, uh, the identity provider and uh, make sure you are got authenticated and get that token, the assertion right to prove that you are the uh, you are already authenticated. So once he get that assertion token, right, he will use the same to uh, show to the SP, the service provider. So based on the relationship, um, the SP will. Uh, do that uh, uh, the uh, verification and provide the access based on the configuration. So this is the overall flow of it looks like um, almost similar right other use cases. So I will be skipping this right. So um, this is one of the one second the authentication is successfully done it will be sent back to the AZ. Here we are going to use uh, and the uh, DO access gateway since the SAML is involved here. So one the DAZ will uh, uh, send that information back to the ICE and ICE will do that uh, digital check, right? The identity check based on the uh, the end user providing the assertion right to the ICE. So that will be uh, verified by ICE and then based on the result of the verification, the end user will get the access. Um, let me quickly show up this uh, as the demo, how it will be done. Let me share my application. Based on the time availability, I might be skipping some steps, but I will try to cover most of the part. Application start. Okay, I'm sharing my desktop. Uh, it's reconnecting. I think it's got connected. So we will see it as portal. So we are in the same ice, uh, we are in the service engine. And uh, since I mentioned we are going to protect the uh, the portal, which is the application here. First thing is we will go to the uh, DO access gateway. Under that, we will start looking to the authentication source. Here we are going to use Active Directory to look for the credentials of the user, like the contact or the employee. This will be configured on the DAZ, which is our on-prem solution, right? And under uh, under that you can verify what are the com configuration items there, like the attributes, uh, the server uh, name itself, right? The 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 FQDN, right? And what are the search base? What are the uh, the base search base we are looking for to, to for the users? And this uh, this is um, the AD part where you are integrating AD with the DAC for the primary authentication. And then the application here. Um, the first part is we are going to get this XML metadata, right? This is to make sure we are uh, integrating the DAZ with the ICE. So if you click download on this, right, there will be XML file downloaded. So we will use that same uh, file to uh, create. Oh, somehow it is not going back. Okay. So under the external identity stores, we will use the same XML file to integrate uh, the DAZ as a um, SAML authenticator, right? So if for the, as I said, we already had the integration done, but I will show the configuration of it done. So uh, under the, uh, we will give a name and under the identity provider configuration, we are going to upload that, right? So if you choose file, we are going to upload the XML file here and the then the information will be populated here. 
So after that, uh, we are supposed to create the groups uh, based on the search base. Right? Here we are going to look the contractors from the AD and that we are going to use as a name as contracts in the ICE. So since we are going to do the demo for our contract and employees, we have that uh, uh, added here. So once you have properly uh, successfully integrated your DO, uh, uh, the DAJ as a SAML authenticator, now since we are um, going to secure the ICE portal, which is the application we are going to secure, uh, we are going to use uh, sponsor guest portal. So under that, we make sure the users are um, getting authenticated by looking into the uh, SAML authenticator, the DAC. So under that, uh, if you click the portal settings, sorry. So we need to make sure the authentication method is the one we just configured, the your SAML, right? So this will uh, make sure uh, users, uh, user IDs will be looking to your SAML. For the primary, it will be the active data, and the second, it will be the due to the second factor authentication. Once this uh, mapping is done, um, we will go back to the, the external identity stores. And at the same SAML ID providers. This time we are going to the uh, service uh, provider info. Here we are going to see that which uh, application or portal is using this particular identity. We, since we done that, it is the sponsor guest portal. So we need to export this uh, file, which is it's an XML file. Um, so once we export the XML file, uh, we need to extract some identity and the um, the application. Uh, URL itself, right? That we are protecting using the DO. So how we are going to do that? If you if we go to the uh, the admin panel, right, under the application, you will see this is the one we are going to. Uh, we need to create a new application. Under that, you need to provide the information that is there uh, under the XML file. So that XML will file have this extra identity ID uh, and the and customer service. This is nothing but um, the, the portal that is the application that is using the uh, uh, SAML authentication method. So once we have this, we need to download this configuration file, which is a JS and right. And uh, the last thing we need to do is to upload that to the DAZ. This is how we are creating a secure communication between all these three components, main components. How we are, where actually we are doing is under the application, and choose file, uh, we are going to choose the JSON file. So once you've done that, this is somehow it looks like, right? Uh, the JSON file uh, that we extracted from the uh, Duo Cloud. So this is the overall configuration on the component side. If I go to the uh, IMD service engine, let's look into the policies. Uh, so here again, we are using default policy set uh, and under the authentication policy, we are going to use uh, this, um, map since we are going to use the portals right under the authorization policy if i scroll down i have um, moreover two important policies here right for our demo which is employee and contractor if you see uh, we are going to use the same uh, the identity uh, mapping that we done under SAML. so we are using employee and we are using contractors so based on uh, the identity lookup done by the daz using its uh, primary source of uh, identity so which is ad so once that is satisfied, we are going to add a SVT. You can provide a um, result right away here, like the variable, uh, whatever the secure access that you are going to provide. In our demo, we are going to uh, uh, assigning a security groups. And using the security groups, we are um, uh, going to uh, do some kind of segmentation and the overall network access. So if I go to the um, uh, suspect policy, so under the restrict policy, we have a matrix where we can see the both the tags are already populated in the source and destination of the overall matrix. And the idea here is we are we are uh, creating we are uh, creating some kind of uh, uh, access I mean access control where we are uh, trying to control the overall uh, the malware um, expansion in between these uh, identities, right? This is nothing but an ACL that we created here. Um, using multiple rules, lines. So if I look into the anti malware so this is what we're trying to deny between the contract and the employee. One of the terms is deny ICMP log. So we are uh, simply uh, denying all this traffic, right? So 
let's go back to the, uh, the I mean the actual demo how it works um, before that let me simply bounce the ports because that might have already some activity done with so we have um, um, contractor on G1018 I'm just shutting down and doing no shot to bounce the port I will go to the contractor let me close that tab and try to access something that can initiate the HTTP traffic, the web traffic. So this will make sure it will redirect to the DAG if you can see the um, the URL, right? So the, now we are providing the credentials of contractor one. These are the primary credentials. So if I click login, it will ask for the secondary authentication method. So for the lab, we are using some kind of pod mechanism. So I need to select appropriate pod to get the push notification. So I'm using 39. So I'm going to use the push uh, as my secondary notification, I mean secondary authentication. So I will go back to my secondary device. I will wait for, in the lab it will take some time, but in real time it will be very quicker. Maybe I will do some kind of triggering. Let's see, I hope I will get the, okay, so there you go. So if I click on the request that I got on my security device, you can see the user who request is contractor one and the device is from this IP. So this, this is the IP actually we configured on the DO. So there is some restriction on DOJ as well, DO admin panel. So we configured anybody from this particular network only can request this uh, portal access. So that level of access can be, policies can be created. So if I click on uh, approve, so this says approve, I will go back to contractor. Now we can see if I click on continue, I will get the, the respect to internet access. So this is um, how we are going to secure the guest portal. Now this particular user has access to cisco.com because he, Sorry, that was not Cisco.com. Okay. So if you if you see, I mean, we uh, we didn't restrict all this access in the policies, but the only thing is we restricted some kind of um, other uh, communication between these two different uh, um, devices or different groups. Similarly, uh, I would like to skip, but um, employee is almost similar process, right? Uh, you will. Uh, you will go to the, uh, the DAG where you provide primary authentication and then it will, there will be a challenge like second authentication. You will get the notification here, you will enter the passcode. So that's the overall uh, demo side, how you are going to secure uh, your application here. We use ice portal as the application. The last uh, use case is the uh, remote access for VPN. Uh, it's almost, uh, the same process, right, but the use case is different where the end users are uh, terminating on the firewall like ASNFTD for uh, the corporate network access, right, and these uh, firewalls are configured in a way, uh, such a way they can look to ICE as a radio server and ICE configured uh, for a secondary authentication. So this is how the overall flow looks like, right. Um, the remote user provides username, uh, the user credentials, uh, ASA, Send that to ICE to verify ICE was configured to look into DAP. DAP has uh, the configuration for the primary authentication and the secondary. It will look for credentials in AD. Upon successful uh, lookup, right, it will send uh, uh, proceed to the secondary, which is DO Cloud. DO Cloud will um, trigger a notification to the secondary device, uh, like a mobile, where you can see a push notification, as we saw just on the demo. Uh, based on the response on the user, uh, it will uh, receive, it will be sent to the Geo cloud. If it is successful, that same information will be sent to our proxy. Proxy will send the radius access accept as a um, the response from the ICE. Now ICE uh, will uh, look into the authorization and send uh, respective results back to the ASA. So this is how the oral process, uh, we are going to secure the remote users. Uh, similarly, I mean, what are the components involved, how we are going to configure, I already explained to the, the flow itself. The last thing we want to mention is uh, 
not just MFA to uh, add a sec another security layer right now uh, with our not just using a static uh, credential which we know, but uh, MFA provides the added layer of security uh, with uh, what you should know, like the push or the notification. But it also has uh, something called the endpoint security posture, like the device health, right? It can verify the device health uh, to a certain extent with the multiple options available. If you see the screenshot here, uh, when you are trying to use uh, the, uh, the application itself on your secondary device, you will see a notification like your computer software is out of, out, out of date. I mean, something is uh, vulnerable and maybe uh, you need to patch, right? And you can create a policies in such a way that if you are not going to update this particular software, uh, maybe you will be blocked, you are no more can be accessed the secondary method of uh, authenticating in respect to days, right? Maybe in five days or 10 days. Similarly, it can verify some of the um, other applications that are running on the device as well, like the browsers, right? Let's say the Firefox is out of date. So it will provide how you can update that, the steps involved, which is like the remediation before you uh, use the actual second authentication. And similarly for that as well, you can cite a block if it is up out of date as per your policies, or you can give some kind of uh, uh, grace period right before they start updating it. So on a summary, um, so um, uh, we have multiple use cases. We talk about four different use cases, right? Uh, when you integrate with, uh, when integration is done with uh, DO. Um, uh, so we have device administration, network access control, the portals and remote users. And we have, um, uh, I mean, if you are considering something like uh, you are going to uh, secure some kind of access using ADS, uh, using uh, your um, LDAP or AD, right? then you, you can look for auth proxy, the device that you are going to uh, deploy. Or if you are going to secure some kind of application that is using SAML, so you, you need to deploy um, uh, a DAZ, right, a do access gateway on your own premises, which can act as a proxy that can um, that can be a, a identity provider and a uh, proxy for a second authentication as well, uh, looking for uh, your cloud. And yeah, as I just mentioned, uh, not just MFA, it can do a posturing as well for your devices that are going to access the network. And yeah, we have multiple options available. I shown you more than some seven to eight uh, options are available, like push, token, the UFA, uh, the access code, all those are, I mean, this is again, based on the criteria, the requirement uh, that you are looking for. Yes, you can try Geo for free. It is for 30 days. You have the link here. Um, try to play with it. It's uh, very simple to integrate and straight away. For some of the application, you don't need DAZ and uh, DAP to test this Geo as well. Um, I think we are already um, more than the scheduled time. Uh, would you like to share the results, Rigo, of the previous poll? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Suresh. Um, so for our final poll, uh, as a reminder, the question was, for which use case would you like to adopt MFA? Uh, and based on the answers, um, it looks like our participants would like to adopt it for remote user VPN. So that was number one. And then uh, next down the list, I see that our participants would like to adopt it for network access control. Yes, that's good to know. Um, thanks, for the, uh, thanks for participating in the poll. Um, all it in each. Uh, would you like to share the resources? I mean, these are some of very useful resources we'd like to share with you, like the uh, ICE community and the Geo community, where you can get answers. You can post your queries there, and uh, you have we have some YouTube channels and some of the guides as well as I mentioned, like user guides, licensing guide that are required for these use cases to be considered. And you can always look into our ICE YouTube channel. Um, we have a lot of videos out there. Even we we post our webinar recordings on in the same YouTube channel. That's our new ice icon. Just want to remind uh, we are going to change that soon. Uh, if time permits, any if any unanswered questions, we go. Um, can we yeah. go for a Q and A? Yeah. Yeah, actually, uh, I was just checking our, our panel, and it looks like our panelists have actually done a, an amazing job of knocking out all the questions. So we do not have any. Uh, questions remaining for live Q&A, um, but we would really like to um, 
you know, thank you, Suresh, for the presentation. Um, and also to our presenters, uh, we really appreciate uh, you speaking to this important topic, MFA, uh, with our audience. I hope that everyone found great value in the information and resources that were shared here today. Uh, we hope that everyone enjoyed the webinar. Um, I would also like to extend, again, a big thank you to our panelists for lending a hand with all of the questions throughout the webinar. We really appreciate your support there. And just a quick reminder for our attendees that you will receive a short pop-up survey as soon as you exit. Uh, and we would really appreciate it if you can just take a few minutes to complete it and let us know how you like today's presentation. We always look forward to receiving your valuable feedback. And again, for those of you who are interested in revisiting this session, we will have the recording available for on-demand viewing within about five business days after today. For your reference, I posted the link to the ICE training videos page in the chat window, and that's where the recording will be located, so feel free to save it or bookmark it. Um, however, you will also be receiving a follow-up email within about um, 10 minutes that will contain that very same link, so please do keep an eye on your uh, inbox for that. Thanks again to uh, Suresh, our presenter, uh, our panelists, and to all of our attendees for joining us here live today. I hope that you all enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.